I'm, uh, I am very thankful for being able to be here with you today. And not only that, but being part of this lectureship. And I don't know how I'm going to do after all the wonderful messages that everybody has already been uh, preaching. Uh, Candice suggests to just come up here and just say, well, everything they just said, watch on YouTube. And that's pretty much it. And we can all go home. I'm very uh, thankful as well to uh, David Brother for the invitation that he extended to me. Uh, to be part of this year's lectureship, and I am thankful for for this congregation as well. I think that I'm not speaking just for myself, but I know the Spanish congregation, the whole Spanish congregation, our feeling is that we feel very blessed to be able to have fellowship with such a, such a faithful congregation. It is uh, an encouragement for us as well to be here. And of course, David, 2012, that's when we met for the first time. We've stayed in touch ever since, and uh, when I did say that I didn't go to a preaching school, but I've had faithful men in my life. Definitely David has been one of them. I consider David a uh, close friend. He's been a good influence in my life, and he's one of those uh, faithful preachers that I admire the work that he's done all of his life. So with that in mind, again, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, as they already said, the topic that I will be presenting uh, today is that the gospel answers the consequences of sin. Uh, that is through the gift of eternal life that we are promised. So I will ask you to please open your Bibles with me and uh, read Romans chapter 6 and, ver and verse 23. And from this passage is where we're going to take and start uh, developing our topic this afternoon. Again, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. And it says as follows. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. As we look at this uh, text, the inspired apostle Paul is telling us first that the wages of sin is death. But then he makes a contrast and he tells us that the uh, that the gift of God or that the that the gift of eternal life being given to us through Jesus Christ, that is basically the answer to the consequences of sin. Now, a few of the speakers already since this morning have been make, making reference to the definition of death, or what death actually means. Uh, as I was looking through uh, both W.E. Vine and uh, Thayer, some of the definitions that I found is that when they talk about death, they actually say that death in the Bible is referred to in uh, more than just one sense. But they also agree in saying that death is also usually always means a separation. So when we consider this passage or this text in Romans chapter, chapter 6 and verse 23, uh, the way that we're going to develop this lesson this afternoon is only two main points that we're going to be uh, discussing. The first one, we're going to be dealing or discussing in detail the consequences of sin. And uh, there's three that I will be sharing with you this afternoon. And once we look at that in detail, then the purpose is to go back and, again, a contrast just like this verse is doing, we'll look at how the gospel answers to each one of these consequences. So we begin with the first one. Uh, the first consequence that we find that comes as a result of sin is the spiritual death, which it's already been made reference of throughout this lectureship. And that spiritual death is basically a separation from God. Now, for us to be able to understand this in more detail, we have to go back all the way to the book of Genesis or to, to the account of Genesis and when we read chapter 1 we know that it talks about God or the account of the creation of the world or the creation of the material world and as we see that and we get to verse 31 we see that God is looking upon the creation upon everything that he has just made and notice what verse uh, one, 31 I'm sorry, of uh, chapter 1 of Genesis it says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. When we look at that statement there, that it says that God saw everything that he had made, and it was very good, that means not just the creation itself, everything that he had made, but that includes us, that includes man. And what this means, or the way that I take it for this lesson, is that that means that there was the absence of sin. There was no sin in man when God created man. God created man perfect, and God created man in a state in which he was able to have fellowship with man. And we see that 
because of the uh, of what God does right after that. And we read again uh, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, And the Lord planted a garden eastward of Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge, knowledge of good and evil. Notice that we see at least three different things here that are, that are mentioned in detail. Number one, the text tells us that when God, what God did, I'm sorry, he made a special place, he planted a garden, and in that garden he made to grow every tree that is good for the sight and good for food. But then it gives us more details, or it, it helps us to see that two other trees stand out in that garden. One being the tree of life, which we will get to that in just a little bit, and the other being the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, as we move forward and we see that God is now getting ready to give the man instructions or giving, uh, or giving the man the first commandment or giving, uh, again, the law of God, we see that he allows man to be able to eat of every single tree that is in that garden, with one exception. We read in, again, Genesis chapter 2, verse six, 16 and 17, that God here commanded the man, saying, you can eat of every single tree that is in the garden. You're allowed, you are free to eat out of it, but only the tree of knowledge of good and evil, of that tree you cannot eat, for in the day that you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Now, it's already been mentioned this morning that the death to which God was referring to uh, right there and then was not a physical death, although that is also a result, but it was a spiritual death, which is the one that we are discussing right now. Because when God tells a man that if he eats of that tree, by, by making that decision to break God's commandment, man is separating himself from God. And this, again, there's a verse that has already been uh, mentioned this morning, and again this afternoon, which is uh, Isaiah chapter 59, uh, verse 1 and 2. And one of the things that we understand here is, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now, again, we're looking at the first consequence of sin, and that is a spiritual death, a separation of man from God, that's breaking the fellowship that, God, that man originally had with God in the beginning when he was created. And now we may ask the question, well, we understand that, that man in the beginning, he made a decision, he broke the commandment of the Lord, and therefore he died spiritually, but how does that carry on to me? How does that affect me? Now, contrary to, to the false doctrine of uh, the original sin, the Bible does not teach such a thing, just like we have already heard this morning. But one of the things that we notice is that as human beings, all of us, we reach an age of accountability. That is, an age where now we are aware, we know the difference between good and evil, we know the difference between right and good. And again, when we make that decision to do evil or to do the wrong things, it is then that we make the same uh, mistake, we, make the, we commit the same sin that man did in the beginning, that we break the commandments of the Lord. And, it's a, and it is at that time that we also ourselves, just like Adam and Eve did, we also uh, are uh, receive the result of that, of that death, which is the, the spiritual death. Now, another verse that I want to share with you is uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 9. And notice that there is another verse that goes with this one. In Genesis chapter 8, as we see Noah and his family coming out of the ark, we notice in chapter 8 that Noah offers a sacrifice to the Lord. And we know that the Lord received or received that sacrifice, but there is a statement that God made in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21. And it says that the intent of the heart of man is evil from the days of his youth. Now notice what Solomon tells us here. Again, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 9, it says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. 
and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Now, why does God bring a young person into judgment? Because that means that as a child, again, a person is innocent, a person does not have sin, but we reach an age in which now we know the difference between good and wrong, uh, good and evil, and at that, at that point, again, knowing that difference and we decide to do the wrong thing, then we fall prey to sin. And as a result or as a consequence, the first uh, consequence that we see now is that there is a spiritual death. We are separated from God. But notice that it's not because Adam and Eve sinned that we are separated from God. It is because of our own sin. The moment that we make the decision to commit the first sin in our lives, that is the moment that we are separated. We break that fellowship that we that we had with God in the beginning when we were uh, when we were born. Now, uh, again, when we speak of this spiritual death, uh, the book of Ephesians chapter uh, two, verse one to three. It, it describes that this spiritual death is a separation from God. But again, this is not the only the only consequence that uh, we get as the wages of sin or the consequences of sin. There is also uh, physical death, which also comes as a result or another consequence of sin. And we know in the New Testament when we read James chapter 2 and verse 26, he tells us that the body without the spirit is death. So he tells us that it is the body that dies, and that the body will die the moment that the spirit uh, leaves, leaves the body. Now, this is, uh, as, I, as I was uh, meditating on this passage, I thought about two examples that I saw uh, in the Old Testament. One of them is the account of uh, the death of Rachel, of what we read about in Genesis chapter 35, verse 17 and 18. One of the things that I noticed there is that as uh, she is given birth to Benjamin, uh, the Bible describes that uh, the, the labor was difficult or the labor was hard and that the midwife, she makes a statement and she says, do not worry, you will have this son also. But when it describes the labor as she is given birth to Benjamin, it says that she was dying or it says in, in parentheses that she died but before that, it says that because her soul was departing. That means that the moment that her soul was departing her body, that's when her body was considered dead, which again goes in line with what James chapter 2 and verse 26. And then we have an example also in the Old Testament, which is an account of the reviving of the son of the widow where Elijah, the prophet Elijah was saying. You remember that he dies and at that time, Elijah is praying to the Lord. This is First Kings chapter 17. And he stretched himself on top of the uh, child three times. And then he begins to pray to the Lord. But the prayer, you notice, is that he's asking for the soul of the child to come back into his body. And once that soul comes back into the body of this child, it says that he revived. And then he presents that child alive to his mother. So again... Physical death is also a result of sin. So we died again, and then we see that in the book of Genesis, in chapter twenty, uh, chapter three. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter three, verse twenty-two and twenty-four. You remember that we made we made mention in the beginning about the tree of life that was in that garden. So when we read in Genesis chapter three and verse twenty-two, it says, "And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil." And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Now verse 24 tells us that God drives the man out. Man gets kicked out of that place that God had made special for him. But we know that in that garden was every tree that was good to the sight and good for food. We also know that in that tree man had access to the tree of life and God never said anything about not being able to take of that fruit of the tree of life. He only, the only exception that God makes in that garden is you cannot take of the fruit of the, of the tree of good and evil. But remember, when man sins, God says, well, now he can stretch out his hand and he's going to live forever. So God makes a decision to send man out of that garden and then God protects the road or the way to get into that tree of, uh, of life, 
and man has no longer access to that tree. And again, this is a direct result of sin. So death comes into the world as a result, or physical death comes in into the world as a result of sin. And we see that again in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 22 and verse 24. This is what uh, First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 22 is making reference when he talks about that, man, that death came into the world by one man and it was extended to all man. Well, it goes back to what happened in Genesis chapter 3. And another thing that we read also in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, it tells us that it is appointed for all men to die once. So in this sense, all of us are subject uh, to this physical death. So then that is the second consequence that we are dealing with when we talk about the consequences of sin. But there is a third one. So we have already seen that as a direct result of sin, there is a, a spiritual death, separation from God, uh, breakage in the fellowship between man and God. Second, we saw that there is a physical death where our body is separated from, from the spirit. But then also we see that there is what the Bible calls the second death. And we have a definition of what this death is when we read in Revelations. And I want you to go with me to the book of Revelations, chapter uh, 21 and verse 8. And notice what the Bible te uh, tells us here. Again, that's the book of Revelations, chapter 21 and verse 8. In the Bible, and this is what it says. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, notice that here John is defining being in hell, which we, which we already saw uh, in the previous lesson, that being in hell, that place which burneth with fire, is called the second death. Now, again, we talked in the beginning that death implies a separation. And what this separation means, this second death, that is an eternal separation from the presence of God. There is no, uh, there is no way, there is no source of uh, goodness anymore. That is a complete separation for eternity, uh, being completely separated from God. And that's what the second uh, death is in the Bible. Now, when we talk about the second death, of course, we have to talk about uh, the place that the Bible describes, or we know the place, uh, hell. And when you think about hell, and you think about every author of the New Testament. Uh, we think about the Apostle Paul, we think about uh, Luke, we think about the Apostle John, uh, every writer of the New Testament, and you would think, well, out of all of the authors, out of everyone in the New Testament, who is the one that makes the most reference to this place, hell? And when we go back to the Gospel accounts, we see that it is exactly our Lord Jesus Christ, the one that made the most reference to this place. Now, why did he do that? He does it for uh, various reasons, but the main reason why he does that is to warn all of us that we do not end in that state, that we do not end in an eternal separation from God. And I want you to bring, uh, I, I, want, I want us to read uh, two passages. The first one, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. And again, this is our Lord Jesus Christ uh, speaking of this second death or making reference of that eternal separation from God. And Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and the body in hell. Now notice that he is warning us who we are supposed to fear, that is, God the creator of all things, because he is the only one that has the power because of our sin to condemn us to that eternal separation from God. And then we read again in Matthew, but now Matthew chapter 25, uh, verse 41 through 46, that we have an account here, and we see all of those that are going to be on the left hand at the day of judgment, or a judgment day. And verse 41 through verse 45 is telling us what we know again uh, as the sin of omission, everything they didn't do that was counted to them as sin, and was the reason why they were on the left on Judgment Day, therefore being condemned to an eternal separation. And notice what verse 46 says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So as we see progress 
uh, in death, we see that, uh, I mean, the, the progress of the consequences of sin, we see that the first one, the spiritual separation, is something that affects us while, while we are alive. So we see Adam, we see Eve, and we see all of us. As long as we're alive, and as long as we reach that age of accountability, and we fall into sin, we are separated from God. We do not have fellowship with God. And it is important that all of us, while we are alive, while we are, while we are in this body, that we address that problem. Because if we continue on and then we die, uh, our soul or spirit departs from the body, then now we are to death, right? We are separated from God spiritually, but then now we have a physical death. And going into that physical death without addressing the sin in the beginning is what causes, uh, what is going to uh, cause for us to be part of that second death eternally separated from God. But now, of course, we, we have dealt or discussed in detail the consequences of sin. And the, consequences of, the consequences of sin is death, just like Romans chapter 6, verse 23, and that means three different types of death. But then the question is, how does the gospel answer each one of these consequences? And we will deal now with the first one. So we said that the first consequence of sin is a spiritual death, a separation from God, no longer in fellowship with God. Well, how does the gospel address that consequence? Well, through the gospel, we are made alive again in Christ. We are given life. We are given eternal life or life eternal in the sense that we are brought back into fellowship with God. Now, with, for this, I want you to go with me and read in uh, the first First, first epistle of John, First John chapter 5, verse 11 through 13. And it says, again, First John chapter 5, verse 11 and th uh, through 13. And it says, And this is a record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath have not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, notice that in this specific uh, epistle, the Apostle John is speaking of this eternal life that is given to us, or that God has given to us this eternal life as something that we possess now. Uh, something that is a possession that we have at this moment as Christians, but the question is, how? How do we have that life, or how do, how do we get that life that comes or uh, that, that is in the Son? Well, we read in John chapter 17, the Gospel of John chapter 17 and verse 3, and it tells us that this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So in this sense, it means that eternal life that God is giving us through the gospel of Christ is by knowing God and by knowing Christ in a special sense. That means by being able to enjoy fellowship with them. But the question is, how do we get to enjoy that fellowship with God? At what moment in time are we as human beings being able to go back and get that fellowship that was lost when sin, number one, first entered the world in the account of Genesis, and number two, when it was broken, when we ourselves committed our first sin. Well, uh, we have made, or we have already heard this morning, uh, also a lot of references about baptism. And it is in baptism that we are able to get this fellowship back with God. Notice what the Bible uh, tells us about uh, baptism. So baptism, when we read in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, a verse that was already read this morning, it says that when those, when, when those that were listening to the sermon of Peter, they asked the question, what shall we do? Well, Peter responds, repent ye and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, it is at that point when we are immersed in the waters of baptism that we die to sin, and because we die to sin, we come out a new creature, a new person in Christ. And when we are a new creation, at that moment also, all of our sins are forgiven. Now, we know that it is because of the blood of Jesus Christ 
that we are cleansed from our sins. And when we read the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 5, it tells us that we are cleansed with the blood of Christ. Now, when does that happen? It happens at the moment that we are baptized. It happens in the moment that we go under the water, that we are immersed. We only see water. As, uh, as a human beings or as a, uh, a human or as a man only obeying the gospel, I know that that is the commandment of the Lord. And we know that all we have back here is just water. But what God is seeing up there from heaven is the blood of his son cleansing us from our sin. And that happens in baptism. That is the moment that we come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what cleanses our sin. So remember when we talked in the beginning that because of sin, man was separated from God. It was the sin that made that division, that separation between man and God. And in baptism, when our sins are forgiven, when our sins are cleansed, that that, that thing that was blocking our fellowship with God is taken out of the way in baptism. And therefore, it is in baptism that we're able to get back that fellowship with God. We're made alive in Christ, and we get, again, our fellowship with God, with Jesus, and with all of the saints that have obeyed the gospel through all the generations until now, and that will continue to obey uh, the gospel. And again, this is the, the way in which the gospel is answering the first consequence of sin. Now, another thing that happens is, yes, at the moment that we are baptized, all of, all of our sins, past sins, have been forgiven. But as John was mentioning in his lesson, there is a possibility that we, as Christians, even after our baptism, we may fall uh, into sin, that we may be tempted and we may sin uh, sometimes. And now the problem or how that is addressed is by us understanding what Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 and verse, 20, verse 27 says. It says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now what does it mean to put on Christ? Well, the Apostle Paul also there in the uh, letter to the Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 is he says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. See, as a Christian, when I am baptized and I put on Christ, that means that as I come out of the water of baptism, not only am I dead to sin, but now I am putting on Christ. That was one of the problems that happened in the Old Testament. Before man knew that he had sinned, or before he had knowledge of good and evil, the Bible says that he was naked, and he was not ashamed. But the moment that now he knows the difference between good and bad, or good and evil, man tries to cover himself. But that was not enough. God had to cover man himself. And there are those who say that, uh, that, that was the first animal sacrifice when uh, God clothed man uh, or Adam and Eve after they sinned. Well, another thing that we see here in a spiritual sense, when we are separated from God, we are naked before baptism. And after baptism, we are clothed by us putting on Christ. And by putting on Christ, it means that now it is no longer my desires, it is no longer my feelings and my uh, again, my desires are the things that I want to do in life, but the way that I live my life as a Christian is now I abide by the commandments of God. And therefore, so long as I remain faithful to the teachings of the New Testament, I continue to be in that fellowship. And that's how the gospel addresses the first consequence of sin. It brings us back into fellowship with God, and it keeps us into that fellowship with God so long as we remain faithful to the teachings of the New Testament. But then again, we saw a second uh, consequence, and that second consequence was uh, physical uh, death. How does the gospel address that problem? How does the gospel address that consequence? And, he, and the gospel does that by giving us the hope of resurrection, by us getting the resurrection of life. See, when we read in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 5 and verse 28 and verse 29, it talks about an hour. It talks about a time when there would be a general resurrection. Every human being will be resurrected. And what we read in John chapter 5, verse 28, 
And verse 29 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now, when we read this passage, we see that now we as Christians, not only in baptism, our sins were cleansed, or we, were, we received the remission of our sins, and we continue to uh, receive or be in that fellowship with God, but also with baptism, we get this hope, the hope of eternal resurrection. I'm sorry, the, the hope of resurrection, the resurrection of life. Meaning that even if I die, I know that one day I will be resurrected. But in that resurrection, it's a two-part resurrection. There's, there are those who will, be who will be resurrected to life, and there will be those who will be, who will be resurrected to eternal damnation. Well, obviously, as Christians, we get the hope of being resurrected to life, of being resurrected with that resurrection of life. Now, what does that resurrection of life uh, mean? Well, we go to the 15th chapter of the first letter to the Corinthians, or the first epistle to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 through 23, tells us uh, the following. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of dead, of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. And we continue reading now, but uh, verse 50, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall all not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and the immortal must put on immortality. Now, we know also that the Apostle uh, John talks about that resurrection. He says that we know not how our bodies uh, will look, but one thing we know for sure, that in that resurrection, the resurrection of life, our bodies will be transformed, our bodies will be changed, similar to the glory of the Christ, similar to the glory of the Son of God. And that is the resurrection that, uh, or that is the answer, again, to that second consequence of sin, that physical death is no longer a problem for a Christian. Because we know that even if we die, when we resurrect, we're not resurrecting with the same body. Our body will be changed. I know that uh, a lot of us, um, or especially a lot of people that are going through a lot of health problems or physical problems, uh, we know that sometimes this body aches. Sometimes we struggle with things in the world and this body when we go through sicknesses, when we go uh, through anything. and. And we know that this body, as we continue to live and we continue to age, is, uh, I guess, is slowly dying. But one of the things that we can be certain is that, yes, physical death, the decay of this body was a direct consequence of sin. But by obeying the gospel, we know that even if we die, when we receive that resurrection of life, this body will be transformed. And it's not the same body because corruption cannot inherit in corruption. This body will be transformed in a way that we are able now to spend eternity with God. And that is the body, again, that we as Christians are fighting to receive. That is the, uh, the hope that, we, that maintains us uh, fighting the good fight uh, as Christians. But then again, now we move on to the third consequence. And we said that the third consequence of sin was the second death an eternal separation from God. Well, how does the, the gospel answer that? And as we already mentioned, that now not only do we receive the hope of resurrection, but now we receive, we receive the hope of eternal life, meaning an eternity with God in heaven. And again, we continue to see that there is an answer for every consequence of sin uh, as we continue to read the scriptures. Notice what Matthew chapter 25, uh, verse 46 says says, and these 
shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And again, we read in Mark chapter 10, verse 29 and 30. And remember, in that, in that account, in Mark chapter 10, verse 29 and verse 30, uh, the disciples are asking our Lord Jesus Christ. They say, well, we have made a lot of sacrifices. We have left things behind to follow you. What, what rewards are we going to receive? And when we read Mark chapter 10, verse 29 and 30, it says, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake, and the Gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, mothers, and children, and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. That is the promise that we have as Christians. Yes, through this life we will have to make a lot of sacrifices. Through this life we will have to leave a lot of things behind. But that is all worth it. Because not only in this life do we receive a hundredfold, but also it says that after, again, uh, after Judgment Day, we will receive uh, the resurrection or eternal life. And it says where, uh, where and when. It says, and in the world to come, eternal life. Now, what is that world to come? What is he talking about here? Well, we go to the book of Revelations, chapter 21, and verse 1 through 7. And here we see the new, the new world to come in which we will receive eternal life. It says, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them, and be their God, and God shall wipe away all their tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that, that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now, when we look at this beautiful uh, description of the world to come, we know that as Christians, again, we have this hope of eternal life. We have this hope that if we remain faithful in this life after baptism, and we die a faithful Christian, we know that in the resurrection we will be placed to the right, and in being placed to the right in the world to come, we will be in eternal life with God. That means we will be eternally in fellowship with God, with Jesus, with all the angels, and with all the saints. And that is how the gospel, again, answers that third consequence of sin. So, uh, I guess to summarize everything that we have talked about uh, this morning, again, we see that the Bible talks about, or uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 talks about the wages of sin, the consequences of sin. We have seen three different consequences. We have spiritual death, separation from God, no longer in fellowship. We have seen a physical death, that's the body literally, physically dying, uh, separation of the body and soul. And then we have seen the second death, which is an eternal separation. And again, just like we have done in every single lesson, we have proven that the gospel effectively addresses every single one of these consequences by providing us uh, again with that fellowship that man lost because of sin, by providing us with the hope of the resurrection uh, after we have lived a faithful life, and again, in the end, providing us with the hope of eternal life, being able to spend eternity in heaven with God. If you are here with us this morning, you're visiting and you have not yet obeyed the gospel. We invite you this morning or this afternoon, uh, we extend an invitation for you uh, to do so. 
course, you must uh, believe first the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. Uh, we know that Jesus Christ, our Lord, He came in the flesh. He came to die for our sins. And in dying for our sins, we know that also He was resurrected on the third day. And after being resurrected, He gave instructions to His disciples. He is sitting at the right hand of God, waiting for that day of judgment. And you may obey that gospel uh, this afternoon by repenting of your sins, by confessing our Lord as the Son of God, and also by being baptized for the remission of your sins. Now remember that God did promise a hundredfold in this life, but He says with persecution, meaning that there will be suffering, meaning that the road might not be easy, but again we have a family in Christ that will help us to remain faithful until the end. And again, if you're a Christian, a member of the body of Christ, and you have been entangled in some sort of sin, uh, we know that we uh, run uh, that danger or that risk that we may be entangled in sin. Uh, we have to correct that again while we are alive, while there is time, so that we may be able to enjoy that hope of eternal life, the third one that we talked about. So this morning or this afternoon, we ask you as well that if you have been entangled in any sin, that you get right with God while there is time. Thank you for your time.